So let's talk house plants. Um, one thing that maybe some of you know, but you may or may not know about me, is um, aside from outdoor stuff, I absolutely love house plants. Um, we have a, a big collection of house plants at home. It's uh, kind of one of my, I guess it's not, if I, uh, if I do it for a living, maybe it's not a hobby, but for sure one of my hobbies, I love, um, I love tropical plants. I keep a lot of tropical plants on the patio during the winter and then bring them in for the, uh, I'm sorry, keep them on the patio for the summer and bring them into the house for the winter months. Um, I love collecting. I have uh, some kind of rare and unusual stuff. I like trying uh, new things. So I just thought that it would be fun to talk about house plants. Uh, I have a lot of people who tell me, nope, I've tried my hand at that. I failed. I killed it. I kill them all the time, whatever the case may be. But So what I thought I would do is just run through a bunch of my favorites. Um, we're not going to drill down deeply on anything um, in terms of, you know, each particular type of plant. I'll give you some, a little bit of quick tips, introduce you to some varieties maybe that you're unfamiliar with, um, tell you how to care for them, and uh, then we'll move on to the next one, that type of thing. So some of these are going to be very, very easy, low maintenance plants. In fact, I guess I'll probably start with those, and then we'll go into some of the, maybe a, a little more, um, uh, a little more care required or a little more, um, you know, specificity in terms of, you know, how it's being cared for, that type of thing. So um, let's just jump into it. Uh, kind of right at the top of the list as far as low maintenance plants, if you've, if you've never had success with house plants, um, I would probably steer you into this plant right here. So this is a plant called a ZZ plant. Um, ZZ is a low light or can tolerate a very low light. Um, it, uh, it actually helps purify the air. It, uh, provides oxygen even in low light circumstances. It is very forgiving in terms of, uh, if you forget to water it. Um, it is not a very water hungry plant at all. So this is the normal, um, ZZ plant right here, which is, uh, obviously green in color. And it's got that kind of uh, sort of laddered effect on the leaves, which is really cool. So very pretty plant. Um, again, really nice for low light situations. If it's, you know, way away from the window, back corner of the room, um, you know, just a room that doesn't have windows, that type of thing, it's probably going to do very well for you. Um, I water my ZZ about I would say once every 10 days to two weeks, um, but I definitely let the soil dry out completely in between watering. So very forgiving plant. Um, that's the ZZ. And this is another ZZ right here, which is called Raven. So it has this beautiful dark chocolatey foliage. In fact, it'll get even darker with, uh, with time. Um, it's kind of interesting because the leaves, I don't know how well you can see that, but in the middle here, here's a new stem coming up. But new stems or new leaves will be green. And then, so they'll open up to green and then mature to that dark brown or, or kind of chocolatey burgundy color. Um, really pretty plant. We have a couple of really nice big specimens. If you want something that's really well established already, we've got some nice giant ones, but we also have these smaller ones. And we do that with a lot of our house plants. A lot of them will have four or five inch diameter kind of starter plants. Um, if you just want to kind of get your feet wet or don't mind watching it grow or want something in a smaller container, those are going to be ideal. If you want to start big or want to have something with a little bit of a presence already, we have a lot of these plants in larger sizes already. So um, so those are a couple of the easier ones, ZZs. Um, also at the top of the list for easy plants, I'm going to bring over my Dracaenas. So Dracaena or, I'm sorry, Sansevieria. Um, Sansevieria or snake plant also goes by the name of mother-in-law's tongue. Uh, so I just brought over three of them here. So all of these actually are um, Sansevieria or snake plant. Um, they're native to Africa. They supposedly keep snakes away. That's why they got the name snake plant. I don't know where the name, uh, I'm not even going to venture a guess on the uh, mother-in-law's tongue um, one there. So but Sansevieria is its botanical name. Sometimes you'll just see it go uh, as that. But So I just brought three different ones up here because there's so many different types of them. There's 
uh, ones that are green with silver. There's ones that are almost pure white with, uh, with their leaves. There's big tall ones, all different types, but they're all very easy to grow. Um, Sansevieria like a relatively dry soil, so you're going to want to let the upper surface dry out. So I typically tell people, like, if you can stick your finger in, you know, two, three inches uh, into the soil, if there's any moisture in there, then let it go. If that upper surface, that two to three inches, is completely dry, then go ahead and give it a good watering. Um, low to medium light is fine for these guys, so they're not, again, going to need, like, you don't have to have a sunroom or a you know, conservatory or anything like that. Um, in fact, they do very well in very low light situations. Um, uh, bedrooms, uh, bathrooms, offices, things like that. Really easy to grow plants. And again, all different colors. So, you know, you've got like this one here with the, with the real interesting yellow and green variegation. And it looks different on the top than it does on the bottom of the leaf, which is really kind of cool. So, you look at this leaf right here, and on the top, you've got mostly yellow with just a little bit of green striping in there. But then when you look at the back side of the leaf, it's completely different. So it's mostly green with the little silver speckles in there and then the yellow stripes. So very cool plants. Um, some of them are going to be broader leaves like these two. Um, but then there's also these here, which are have a cylindrical leaf. So most of these go by Sansevieria cylindrica. But there's all different types, so they have these really cool cylindrical shaped uh, leaves. Sometimes they get braided like this. That's obviously just you know human intervention. They grow naturally with these long spiky leaves. Um, I really like those a lot. I have uh, in my in one of my collections here. This is a, a little one called starfish. So it's got the cylindrical leaves, and uh, this is kind of a younger one that I took a cutting uh, from and, and have grown. But it almost looks like a starfish from the top, so it's kind of cool. This one's, uh, I don't know, I think I've had it for, well, the cutting I probably took maybe two years ago. Um, so really cool little plants, but very, very easy to grow. Um, Sansevieria and ZZ for sure right at the top of the list as far as easy to care plants, easy to care for plants. Also right at that, the top of the list should be, this one right here, this is a pothos. Um, this is kind of a marbled one. Sometimes you see these called like devil's ivy and all sorts of other, there's a lot of names for them. There's also, this is another one where there's very, um, a lot of variety, uh, a lot of different colorations. Some are all green, some are green with yellow marbling. This one here, this is called Marble Queen. And you can see where it gets that name, that nice marbling throughout the uh, leaf here. Um, but very easy to grow, medium to low light. They're kind of a vining plant, so they're really nice on a bookshelf or, um, you know, on a desk or something where it can kind of drape down a bit. Um, doesn't have to be there. You can also keep it just in a nice container like this, and if they start to vine out, you can trim them back. Um, they also work really nicely in a small hanging basket. So, you know, if you have a, a hook or something in your kitchen that you can hang something from, uh, this would work really well. Um, one, I mean, it's not really, this is not uh, anything crazy innovative, but uh, just going to explain this because this is the way I keep most of my house plants at home. This is called a cash pot. So when you're looking for house plant pots, most of them are going to not going to have a hole drilled in the bottom. So when you're putting um, pots outside for the summer months, something that you're going to care for outdoors, it's going to have a hole in the bottom of the pot for drainage. So you want to make sure when you're selecting pots for your house plants that you pick something that doesn't have a hole, or if it does have a hole, that you get a tray of some kind to put underneath it. Obviously, you don't want to damage your floor or desk or, or uh, table. Um, but anyway, take these cash pots, so no hole in here. And then a lot of times I just leave it right in that plastic uh, grower pot or nursery pot and just set it right inside there. That makes it really easy when it comes time for watering. I can take that out. I can bring it over to the kitchen sink is what I typically do at home. And then I can water that real good, let the water run all the way through the bottom. And then after it's, you know, relatively dry, then I can just go ahead and put it back into its cash pot. What you don't want is water sitting at the bottom of the pot. I would say for sure the vast majority of of uh, houseplant deaths, I would say, are a result of overwatering. Um, houseplants typically need far less water than most people think. Um, 
especially when we don't have temperature extremes in the house. Um, so, you know, we don't have 80, 90, 100 degree days uh, in the house, obviously, and we also don't have the extremely low temperatures. So the plants, you know, they, they maintain kind of a nice consistent balance. So aren't going to need a lot of water. The other thing you want to keep in mind is that especially at this time of year going into winter, most of these plants are uh, tropical, of course, and most of them, the winter season would be their dry season and would also be the time of year when they would uh, not be growing much. Of course, less light means less growth. And so during periods of low or no growth, we're not going to be uh, watering or fertilizing nearly as often. So in terms of watering, um, let the plant almost completely dry out before you water. In terms of fertilizing, I do little or no fertilization during the winter time. If you are going to feed, uh, or if you have something that it does need kind of a little more um, feeding than normal, then what I would do is do like a half rate and do it much less frequently than maybe what's recommended on the bottle. So um, just a little tip, um, I fertilize uh, generally starting in March or April is when I start fertilizing my house plants, and then they do get fed during the summer months when they're outside, or even if they're inside, they get fed at that time of year. So um, that's the uh, pothos or pothos, I hear them called both things. Um, I thought I would introduce you to uh, one of my favorite groups of plants. This is a Hoya right here. I'm going to take it out of that pot. So Hoyas um, are a really, really broad group of plants. There's all different colors and variations on it. Um, this one is just a fairly simple dark green leaf with a nice white margin on it. Some of them have a lot more white. Some of them have burgundy and yellow marbling on them. Um, I have a really cool one at home that I like. It's called a Hindu rope hoya. Um, and the leaves are all curled and contorted and twisted. And it, the branch almost makes this cool, like, braided rope look to it. So very cool plant. Um, but these are pretty easy to care for as well. Um, these long stems, actually, hoyas hold a lot of moisture in that long stem. So it's another plant where you're not going to need a lot of regular watering. So give it a really thorough soaking, let the water run all the way through the pot, and then let it basically completely dry out before you water it the next time. Um, Hoyas are typically medium light plants. They're not, they certainly are not going to want to bake in a hot, hot window. Um, mine at home is in an east facing window. Um, it's a kitchen window, it's a nice little uh, kind of deeper ledge. And uh, so it has um, morning sunlight, and then shade uh, all the rest of the day. But so I would call that, you know, kind of bright indirect uh, for that one. And it's been doing very, very well for me. So I like that one. Um, most of our staff, I would say almost everyone that I can think of has a, a Hoya of some kind at home because they're fun, they're easy to grow, and uh, they're cool plants. Uh, let's keep moving along. This right here um, is often called a mini monstera, although it is actually not a monstera at all, but that's what we're going to call it because that's what uh, it commonly goes by. So um, really cool plant. This is kind of a vining uh, plant that if you give it something to climb or grow on, it's going to go very, very upright. So if you lean it against, uh, say, in the corner of the house, um, corner of a wall, something like that, that, it'll kind of lean against the wall and grow up. If you put uh, something like a moss pole uh, in its container, I was going to show you this here. We actually I brought up two um, two different types. This is this one here, which is longer and narrower, is actually made out of uh, coconut coir. So this is technically a coir pole, not a moss pole. And this is a moss pole here. Both of these are um, are bendable. So you can kind of make some cool shapes out of them and stick this in the pot and then it's going to vine and kind of grow and attach itself to that. So any of your vining type plants, um, many of the philodendron, we'll talk about those in just a little bit. Um, monsteras, both this one here, the mini monstera, again, not a true monstera, as well as the true monsteras, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, all of those like these. So um, the other cool thing about these is you can soak this. You can put a little water on here. So in this case, this is sphagnum moss wrapped with like a jute 
type uh, twine. And so this can hold humidity in there, which is nice for these plants. They, um, the mini Monstera, regular Monstera, as many of the philodendron uh, have this little um, structure called a, an aerial root, um, which again, I know it's kind of hard to see on this. You'll see it a little easier on some of these other plants, but it's this little root right here. It's this, on this one right now, it's just a little nub. But that little nub is, um, is an aerial root. And aerial roots can gather humidity, um, so moisture for the plant, but it also is, they're used for structure. So they'll attach themselves in the wild. They would attach themselves to like a tree trunk or something else so that it gives them stability. So that's what those aerial roots will do. It's also a really great way if you're going to try to propagate a plant. That aerial root can actually turn into a regular root. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit uh, later as well. So um, mini monstera, um, medium light would be ideal for them. Um, pretty easy to grow, um, pretty vigorous. Uh, you can cut this as much or as little as you need to. It is a great plant for propagating. In fact, this one, if you are going to propagate, you can cut this. So propagating, if you're not familiar with that word, that's just uh, basically the word for making more plants. So if you want to make more of this, you can cut this. I typically cut right above um, another leaf. So in this case, like here's a leaf here. So I would trim right above that. And then this uh, stem, I can just stick that in a glass of water and it will root. And once it's got uh, nice white roots on it, then it's ready to go into a pot of soil and become a new plant. You can grow it in your own home. You can give it away. That's always kind of fun to give away plants. So um, that's the mini Monstera. And you can kind of see the foliage there. Um, it's got that cool uh, fenestrations or these uh, like holes and uh, kind of deep lobes in there. So very cool little plant. Uh, again, very easy to grow. So this is the this is the regular uh, monstera, um, monstera deliciosa. So it's got these cool lobed leaves. Um, these leaves are gonna oh, we got a stink bug too. Fun. Um, these leaves as they mature, these are these are immature leaves here with no fenestrations or holes um, and cuts and stuff in the leaf. So these are immature. As the plant matures, you're going to get these really, really big, deep uh, lobes. You're going to get holes in the leaves. Um, it's a very easy to grow plant. It will develop those aerial roots. So you can kind of see here, let me spin this around. Right here is a nice long, relatively long for this uh, aerial root. And we just put this little, um, we have these little copper, um, it's kind of a plant stake that you can put in there and plants can grow on it. So those are always kind of fun too. Um, so that's the regular Monstera. Again, I would say like medium light for that one. And um, pretty, it's another one that's pretty easy to grow. A favorite of houseplant collectors. Um, there's some white varieties. I've got, uh, I've got one here. Um, it's got beautiful white marbling in the leaf. This one is called Thai Constellation. So this is actually part of my own collection. Um, this is my little baby one. I have a much larger one, um, which is a Monstera Albo, um, which has big, beautiful white leaves. So if you come by the store, you can see that I have it on uh, kind of on display here. It's not for sale, but it's a really cool one. It's probably got 20 plus leaves. It's actually in the background. I don't know how well you can see it, but it's in um, this little room behind me, which is right off of our uh, main office is uh, kind of our rare and unusual houseplant collection. So we do have a lot of uh, rare, hard to find houseplants. We don't keep them out in the greenhouse with the other plants for two reasons. One, sometimes they walk away uh, and we don't want to see that. Um, and number two, sometimes some of them uh, require just a little bit more care and uh, they're expensive little plants. So we don't want them to, um, you know, we don't want to see them uh, have any issues out there. So um, so the room behind me has a lot of cool little things. So if you are into kind of unique house plants, you may want to come check that out. Uh, let's keep rolling along here. I brought a uh, rubber plant, or you also hear them called rubber trees over. Um, this one here, I think, is just Teneki. Yeah, this is Teneki. So it has um, dark kind of uh, greenish colored center with uh, white with pink all throughout. 
Um, rubber plants are very easy to grow. They do like to dry out in between waterings. I put these in bright light. I keep this outside all summer long um, and then bring it in during the winter time. Um, when it's out in the summer, I have it, uh, it basically gets morning and early midday sun um, and then kind of some shade the rest of the day and it's always done very well out there. Um, at home, I have it um, in the sunroom. It gets uh, kind of some morning and midday sun. Um, the new leaves tend to come out with a really nice burgundy tinge to them, kind of more pink and burgundy, and then will slowly kind of turn white and cream. Um, they're cool plants. Most of the time when you get a rubber tree or rubber plant, it's just going to have one stem like this. If you did want to try to get the, tr the tree to branch out, snipping it or clipping it right above a leaf here will tend to cause the plant to branch out a little bit more. So really easy to grow plants. Um, they're available in green, kind of dark, almost blackish green. Uh, there's the white. There's also some very rare varieties. So um, this is another one where you've got your basic ones. You've got your kind of rare and collector ones as well. This is kind of somewhere in between. Um, Teneki's very cool. I really like this one a lot. I've had it for several years. I really enjoy it. Uh, I guess we can keep going with easy plants. So this one here, um, you know, this is this is one that reminds me of my childhood. Um, it seems like every one of uh, my aunts and uh, great aunts and grandparents and my, you know, mom and dad's friend, everybody seemed to have a, a spider plant somewhere in their home back in the 70s and 80s. And um, I think they kind of fell out of favor for a little while. I think houseplants in general did, right? They're kind of making a comeback. Houseplants were very popular in the 70s and 80s, um, kind of fell out of favor, and now we're making a massive comeback. Uh, and I think rightfully so. I think they offer a lot of fun. It's fun to take care of them. It's fun to watch them grow. It's fun to propagate. Uh, it's fun to give some of them away. Um, they make great presents. If you're looking for a gift for the holidays, a hostess gift, a teacher gift, something like that, or maybe it's just a gift for yourself, um, great idea. But spider plants are really, really easy to grow. Um, you can grow them just about anywhere. They can take bright light. They can take low light. Um, they get the name spider because they get these little um, kind of offshoots here. And each one of these offshoots can become a, another little baby. So you can actually just pluck these off like I just did here. Drop that in a cup of water. It's going to start to grow little roots and it's going to become a brand new plant. So you can, uh, this is another one that is great for a hanging basket or great on a bookshelf or somewhere where it can obviously hang or arch over like it's doing right here in, uh, in this, uh, on this table. So those are fun. They're, uh, spider plants are available in all different colors as well. Greens, greens and whites. Um, there's different types of white on there. Some have kind of curly leaves. Uh, some have a little more yellowing in them. So they're all very cool. Um, well, let's talk, uh, okay. We'll talk about this one and then we'll make a little switch here. Um, one of the more popular uh, house plants um, are, is anything in the citrus family. I'm just going to kind of lump all the citrus together. I actually brought up this lime, uh, this little lime tree here. It's got beautiful white flowers on it. I wish you could smell it. It smells fantastic. Uh, citrus flowers have a very sweet citrusy fragrance. Um, the leaves can be crushed. They also have a really nice fragrance to them as well. Um, but this little lime tree here makes a very nice um, house plant. It likes very bright light, so you do need a good sunny window for them, you know, preferably like a south or a west facing window somewhere where it's going to get quite a bit of light. Um, don't be surprised if your citrus, this one's actually doing really well right now and in fact has produ produced quite a bit of new growth, but oftentimes when I bring, I have a variegated lemon tree. Um, so when I bring that in for the winter, oftentimes I'll lose half or three quarters, sometimes more of its foliage. That's totally normal. Um, citrus, even if you go to California or Florida or places like that, citrus oftentimes will go sort of into like a semi-dormant uh, season during the winter months. So they're going to they're gonna drop a lot of their foliage during the winter months, even outside in their, I don't know, that's not necessarily their natural environment, but uh, where they're growing well um, in the States anyway. 
Um, but they, so they do shed a lot. So don't be concerned if that happens. Um, if you're seeing yellowing out at the tip, sometimes that can be uh, overwatering. Um, but if you're just seeing some yellowing throughout the middle and it's starting to drop some foliage, totally normal for a citrus to do that. Um, keep an eye out for insects. Citrus are uh, insect magnets. Um, so you do want to kind of watch out for uh, mealybugs and uh, aphids and things like that because it can be fairly common as well as scale. Um, but keep an eye on them. But otherwise, really great plants. Some of them um, you can kind of keep in more of a, like a little shrub or dwarf tree uh, type habit. Uh, other ones you can grow into a nice tall tree. If you want to have something in a big pot, they actually do produce fruit. Um, so very cool plants. Um, and... Uh, the fragrance and flowers alone, even if you don't want the fruit, the fragrance and flowers alone is uh, is well worth it. Um, I guess since I mentioned insects, I'll uh, do a quick little deal here on um, uh, houseplant insect control. Um, I always just tell people, if you have houseplants, you're probably going to have some insect issues. It's just kind of the nature of the beast. Um, you know, generally, if you get them under control, um, you know, once you get it under control, usually you're not going to have a lot of issues, but it's going to happen at some point or another if you've got house plants. Sometimes they're deep inside the soil, and even though you buy a nice clean plant, and we do our best to keep our plants clean, and same with all the growers that we work with, but it's going to happen, you know, a, a bug or an egg or something is in some weird little place in the pot, and it then down the road it comes out um, or finds its way out and will start to affect the plant. Um, most often uh, on house plants we deal with scale and mealy bugs. So mealy bugs are little white cottony bugs that you might see on the plant. Um, scale is like a little raised bump. They're typically brown or black. Um, sometimes you don't notice them, but you no might notice that a leaf is kind of shiny or, or sticky. Um, oftentimes scale will secrete uh, something called honeydew, which is kind of a shiny sticky liquid um, so it oftentimes it drips onto a leaf um, so how can you care for those one thing i always recommend if you've got your house plants outside during the summer months is before you bring them in spray them with a really uh, good insecticide um, there's a lot of options uh, i like to use a product called bug blaster it's a good all-purpose uh, insecticide the active ingredient is bifenthrin um, I usually will spray most of my house plants with that uh, a week or so before I bring them in. Um, that does a really good job of controlling insect problems. In fact, the years when I've been smart and have done that, I rarely have any issues over the winter months. The years when I haven't, uh, sometimes I get some little flare-ups. If you do have a little flare-up in the house, uh, don't be alarmed. There's a lot of options there. Um, one thing you can do is something like this. This is called systemic houseplant in insect control. It's made by Bonide. It's a granular product, so it's a little fine kind of powdery, granule, very small granular product. What you do with it, there's a little chart on the label. You're going to measure your pot. It's going to tell you how much to use. And you want to just kind of scratch that into the surface. So you can take, like, honestly, like a little fork or something like that, maybe a plastic fork, but something kind of scratch it into the surface. Maybe you actually have some little tiny houseplant tools, like a little tiny houseplant rake, something like that. Great. Just kind of work it into the soil a little bit. Follow the instructions. That lasts for about eight weeks, so it's a systemic product. It gets absorbed through the root system, then gets translocated throughout the plant, and it works for aphids and whiteflies and mealybugs and scale and, uh, honestly, just about everything that can uh, affect a house plant. So this is really good, very easy to use, and you're not spraying anything, so um, you can use this in the house during the winter months or whenever you need to. I do tell people if you've got a, you know, kind of a, a more specific outbreak or something happening, you may need to spray because this does take a little while for the plant to absorb it and for it to start working. Um, if you do need to spray, I brought up three things that can be used for house plants. Um, this is called eight insect uh, control. This particular one is made out of sulfur and pyrethrins. Um, so very easy to use. It protects against some different, different disease issues. Um, but also takes care of a lot of insect problems like uh, mites, spider mites, things like that. So very good. It'll take care of aphids. Um, it can be used in the house. What I do with mine at home, if I ever do have to spray in the house, we have a little laundry tub down in the basement. Um, I just take the plant down into the laundry tub, put it in there, spray it real good, let it dry, and then put it back 
in its uh, normal location. The other thing you can do if you have a uh, heated garage, you can take it out to the garage to spray. If you do get a nice day during the winter time, you know, if it's like over 40 and you're not going to leave it out there for too long, you can take a plant outside to spray if you need to. Um, worst case scenario, I recommend putting a couple of towels down on the floor or around the plant and then spraying it. But it's something that's too big that you can't move. Um, works well. Um, I brought up neem oil because that's another good organic insect control, safe for indoor plants. Um, it kills eggs, larvae, as well as adults. So um, neem oil is a really good product to use on house plants. Uh, you may want to check your label or check online to see if, if it'll work on your particular type of plants. There's not too many that are um, uh, that will be damaged by you know oil type sprays like this. And then lastly, I brought up insecticidal soap. Um, again, it's uh, it's good and safe to use in the house. Um, it does work on uh, a wide variety of insects, specifically aphids and white flies. So that's a really good one. So um, just thought I'd bring up a couple of those because, like I said. If you're going to keep house plants one way or the other, someday you're going to end up with some insect issues. It's uh, not a matter of if; it's a matter of when. Um, okay, let's talk about philodendron, one of my favorite groups of plants. Monsteras kind of fit into that uh, group, sort of. Um, I brought up a couple here. I think there's one more somewhere. Uh, I'll try to find it. Um, here it is. Uh, so philodendron are a cool group of plants. Um, these are um, plants that do like a little bit more humidity. Um, so they, they can be misted. You could get a humidifier. Um, Humidifiers work really well, especially if you're keeping your plants in a specific room or specific location. Um, otherwise, you can mist the foliage. We sell tiny little misters. I put uh, filtered water in there and we'll mist the plants periodically. That's a really good way to introduce a little extra humidity to the plant, especially during the winter months when our humidity is uh, oh so low around here. But I brought up three different philodendron. I just brought up three that were very different, um, so you can kind of see the variation. Um, this one here is um, a, uh, they're both, both of these actually are, um, this one's a lemon, I think called lemon lime. Um, let's see if it actually has a name. This one's called moonlight. This one's uh, lemon lime here. And uh, so very different looking. This is a more vining type of philodendron, where this is a more upright variety of philodendron here. So the vining type can grow on a bookshelf. Uh, it can grow on, um, you know, on a tabletop, anything like that, and just kind of will sort of maintain itself. Beautiful yellow foliage. Uh, medium light on these is ideal. Um, as I mentioned, they do like a little more humidity. Um, when you water them, water it very thoroughly. Let the water run out the bottom, and then water when the upper half of the soil is dry. If you're doing one of these more upright varieties like this one right here, or this one is one of my favorites. This is a Florida Green Beauty. It's got this really cool uh, leaf shape. So when you're doing these, you're probably going to want to give it a moss pole or some type of support or structure for it to grow on. So this is still very young. It's probably basically ready for a support. You can kind of see, I'll just kind of tip it over. You can see these longer stems. This one actually is pretty nice because you've got, looks like three stems in here, which is really nice. You've got these aerial roots forming. So again, those would attach themselves to the pole in order to support or give it strength. Um, philodendron leaves are very cool when they, um, when they emerge. So there's a new leaf coming out right here. So they're all kind of rolled up tight. And over the course of several days, you'll see it kind of opening up until it opens up fully. So really cool plants. There's variegated varieties. We actually, I think, have we have a, um, a Florida ghost in the uh, in a rare uh, collection back here. Um, Florida ghost has some really cool uh, coloring on it. So um, I love philodendron. Again, they do require just a little bit more care in terms of giving them a little extra humidity, maybe a plant support of some kind for them to grow on. So uh, those are the philodendrons. Let's talk succulents for a minute. I 
brought up a few. Um, succulents, I'm going to kind of, I'll talk about just a couple of varieties that I brought up. But in general, succulents are leaves that have a, a, a thicker leaf that is able to retain or hold a lot of moisture. So they tend to be um, much less water hungry plants because they are able to hold uh, a lot of that moisture. So I brought up a jade, which is one of my favorites. Uh, we'll post some photos. I have a big, beautiful jade at home. I've had it for somewhere between 15 and 20 years. I've lost count, um, but it's just about uh, to bloom fully. Um, really cool plant. So it blooms during the winter months, which is always a um, welcome addition after bringing all the plants in and everything outside is dying back. Then um, oftentimes, usually in November or December, my jade will bloom with these beautiful little star-shaped, very pale pink flowers. Um, this is actually a cutting um, from my jade at home. We have uh, a lot of these little guys. Um, we'll talk about that in a minute. This is a uh, lace aloe or uh, aristata aloe. Um, very cool plant. Sort of looks like a Hawarthia, which is another type of succulent, which I didn't bring up here. Um, but really, it's a very fast-growing aloe. Um, it doesn't look like your normal aloe. Aloe, it has these little tiny white bumps that are kind of raised on the leaf. Um, very good plant for propagating. If you like to give away plants, um, they're kind of fun. Really easy to grow. And then I brought up uh, this one here, which is a string of turtles, which has this kind of uh, kind of light green leaf with little um, little dots on it. Each of the leaves looks like a little turtle, kind of a turtle shell. It's a nice little succulent type plant that will um, hold water in its leaves and in its stem, so it does not need a lot of water. This one happens to be in a tiny little hanging basket. You don't have to leave it in a hanging basket. It can go in a normal pot and just drape over the sides, um, but they're a lot of fun. So one of the things that I wanted to mention about um, about succulents in general is um, in terms of watering because I, I think there's a little bit of a myth in terms of the amount of water that succulents want. So when I water a succulent plant, I really like to water it to the point that uh, that there's water running right out the bottom of the uh, um, of the pot. So I'll put it on a tray or bring it over to the sink. Sometimes I'll even stick them in a bowl of water. You know, if it's a if it's something like this right here, where you, if you look at the top, it's really, it's actually wider than the pot is right now. It's fairly difficult to get water in there. Maybe it even has a really tightly packed root system that's not uncommon on succulents at all. Um, I'll just stick the whole plant in a bowl of water for about 20 minutes, half hour, something like that, and then remove it. That's a great way to water. Otherwise, I just have my little watering can here, and I really, really soak this. So this is this jade. It's ready to be watered. Um, you're probably not able to see the water all that well, but I'm really filling this all the way up to the top. And then we're just going to kind of let that perk through the soil. Keep in mind that when you have really dry soil, like in a succulent that maybe only gets watered once every few weeks or once every month, the soil really, really dries out. And so it may not have the ability to... Uh, to kind of absorb that moisture all that quickly. Sometimes it just runs right through the pot and it doesn't even, you know, the little fibers that are in the soil um, don't have enough time to, to really soak that moisture up. So a lot of times what I like to do is water it a couple of times. So this was filled all the way up to the brim and there's actually no water coming out of the bottom yet, which is good. So this soil is actually gonna hold that moisture. Um, sometimes though, when I water, like this guy probably because I can, I can already tell you if I lift that up, you'd see it's pretty dense with roots. It's hanging over the sides. There's not a lot of water holding capacity in this soil right now. Okay, now the water's starting to come off the bottom of this pot. Um, so what I like to do, water it really, really, really thoroughly, and then don't water it again for three, four weeks, whatever the case may be, depending upon the plant. So um, that's just a little bit of a tip on watering succulents. So um, they, uh, much like trees, they do need moisture. They don't want water every day or every week or anything like that, but they do want a lot of moisture and then they want to be allowed to dry out for a, quite a period of time. One of the things that you can do, um, with succulents is you can check the leaf here. So 
Like this is really nice and firm. These leaves right here are very firm when I kind of squeeze it. My jade at home is very good about telling me when it wants water. Right now at home, I know that the leaves are, are really nice and firm like this, nice and plump. But over the course of the next couple of weeks, as it's using its moisture, and I think we're going to have some, as far as the forecast goes, some relatively clear sunny days. I have mine on a kind of a south window, um, so it gets quite a bit of sun. So over the next couple of weeks, it's going to get a lot of sun. It's inside, of course, so it's going to dry out over the next couple of weeks, and the leaves are going to start to get um, just a little bit soft, a little bit more limp um, in their, you know, kind of in their texture or feel, and that's going to tell you when it wants water. So if it's nice and uh, firm, I usually let it go, although you can check the soil, that type of thing as well. But sometimes the soil is dry, but the plant still has plenty of moisture, so you can kind of let it go for uh, for a period of time. So that's the... Uh, just a little bit about watering succulent plants. Um, succulents in general tend to like um, pretty bright locations. There's not too many succulents that you're going to find for um, shady locations. So that's just something if you have brighter windows or if you, um, you know, if you do have bright, hot window locations like our sunroom faces south, well, we have windows on the east and south at home. And so those south windows are very hot. The east windows are, you know, cool morning light and then shade the rest of the day. Um, and so things that like a little more indirect light, I put towards the east window. But along the south windows, um, I have my succulent collection, and they're all doing really well. Um, one of the plants that is a little bit tougher to care for, although this is one of the easier ones, this is a rabbit's foot fern. But generally speaking, in Door ferns can be difficult to grow because they do tend to like a little more humidity, um, and we don't have that oftentimes uh, in our homes, and it can be hard to keep them um, keep them looking good. But this is a really cool variety. Again, it's called Rabbit's Foot, and you can see why they call it Rabbit's Foot. It gets these cool little uh, like aerial roots or stems with fuzz on them. Uh, very cool plant. Um, so put it in a pot that you don't mind it kind of growing over the sides. Um, indirect light is ideal for these. It's another one that when you water it, you could stick it in a bowl of water. You can really water it very, very thoroughly and then let it dry out in between watering. So um, rabbit's foot fern, indirect light, um, even, you know, semi-shaded locations are going to be really good for that one. Just do a couple others quick. If you do have that bright light, um, hot south windows, things like that, or west windows, um, this could be a fun plant for you. This is called a bird of paradise. Um, bird of paradise has these beautiful orange and blue flowers. You can kind of see a little bit of it on the tag right here. Orange and blue flowers in the middle of the winter. So it's really a cool plant for winter interest um, because it blooms in, in the winter when it's inside the house. Because... A lot of tropical plants only bloom when uh, um, when they're outside, so it's kind of fun to have something blooming in the winter time. So, uh, bird of excuse me, bird of paradise, hot, bright light, um, consistent moisture. So, it's another one where you just let the upper surface dry out. When the upper surface has dried out, you know maybe the upper third or so, upper couple of inches. Give it a good soaking. Um, they really like that. You see them growing wild all over Florida. If you think about Florida's climate, it rains pretty frequently, but the soil is very well drained. So it rains, but it's always draining through there. So they do get cons pretty consistent um, moisture, typically where they're, uh, you know, where they're growing. Not necessarily wild, but, uh, you know, where they're growing in the landscape. So um, we'll finish up with... Uh, Two of the easier plants here. Oh, it needs some water. We'll give the pothos some water. Um, so I brought up a uh, this one right here, which is a uh, pilea um, right here. This is called pilea peperomoides. It also goes by the name of Chinese money plant. Um, this one here is kind of a cool little one called Bitcoin. It has a little bit larger leaf. You can kind of see these nice rounded leaves. Weird stems and st just kind of a cool plant all the way around. Um, I actually had one uh, that I kept in our bathroom in our um, for 
uh, in about five years, I finally just parted ways. Uh, he and I parted ways this year. It was uh, time to let it go. Um, east facing window, um, humid area, but um, not great about the watering on this one, but is not super water hungry. Easy to propagate if you want to cut these stems. They make these little pups, little baby plants around the outside. So you can just cut those stems off, stick them in a glass of water or a little bud vase or something. They will start to root and then you can grow more. Um, so I, they're also known as a friendship plant because they do make so many little pups that you can give them away. But really easy to grow plants. So indirect light, uh, bright, bright indirect light would be ideal for them. Um, Pretty easy to grow plants. I've seen them trained as little trees. You can grow them as kind of a more moundy type, you know, shrub almost. Um, but really cool little plants and very easy to grow. Um, rarely do you have insect issues on these too. So that's kind of a cool one. And then um, lastly, I brought up a Tradescantia here. So uh, this particular one is kind of neat. It's got uh, green and burgundy leaf tops. But if you look at the bottom, the leaves are almost kind of a kind of a pinky color. We have all different colors and types of Tradescantia. We have green and white ones. There's pink ones like Nanook. Um, we have uh, silver, silver and green um, called Zabrina. There's a few other ones. These grow really well in pots. They grow really well in hanging baskets. They're very, very easy to propagate. You can just, just take a cutting off of this and actually just stick that cutting right into a mixture of uh, like peat and perlite or a typical potting mix will work really well. So very easy uh, to care for plants. Um, typically keep these in uh, kind of that, again, more of that bright indirect light. So they don't want to necessarily cook, um, but they don't want to be in the, you know, dark shady corner of the house. So you know, several feet away from a window would be ideal for them, or if it's an east-facing window where it's going to get some morning light, um, that would be plenty for it, typically. Um, they tend to kind of drape or crawl, um, so, you know, give it something that it can kind of hang over the edge, um, but again, really easy to grow plants, and they're, they're kind of fun, and there's all different colors, so they brighten up a room, too, which is, which is nice. So, um, I think I talked about most of I think I talked about everything I wanted to um, up here, but most of these are pretty easy to grow plants. Again, when you start to get into some of the like more collector type plants, some of those are going to require a little bit more care, but can be fun once you get your feet wet with plant with house plants. So I just wanted to show you some of the easier to grow ones, give you a few care tips. Um, if you ever have questions about your house plants, uh, we actually have more than a handful of people on staff here who, uh, aside from, you know, being very knowledgeable about uh, trees and landscape and design and all that kind of stuff, um, many of us are uh, houseplant buffs and have uh, a lot of experience uh, growing, propagating, maintaining uh, houseplants. So we'd be happy to try to help you out with whatever might be uh, the issue that, you, that you're seeing. Um, and then if you're looking for some recommendations on houseplants, you know, feel free to um, first monitor the, the location. Look at it at a couple different times during the day. You know, morning, midday, afternoon, how bright is the light? Maybe even get a little bit of a light meter. But, you know, monitor the light throughout the day and maybe even take a picture of the location and bring that in. And we'd be happy to try to help you find a plant that would fit that location. So uh, I hope that this was helpful. And uh, until next time, I hope that you have a, a wonderful day.